Central, good to see you here today. Welcome, great to see you. And hey, we want to welcome everyone who's joining us online. So, uh, well, we want to begin with a time of worship today. We're in a series on the Lord's Prayer. And though this song is based on Psalm 8, the chorus declares these famous words from the Lord's Prayer that say, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we want to make that the prayer of our hearts today. So would you stand with us? Let's sing of the excellencies of God. Here we go. When I look, when I look at your heavens, the moon and stars, you sit in motion, oh God. I sing our glory and honor. What is man that you are mindful? The son of man that you would care for him. We sing our glory and honor. Oh Lord, our Lord. Oh, how awesome are your ways. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord. May we see your kingdom come. Father, may your will be done in all the earth. In all the earth you gave dominion to your children. And you crown them, oh God, with glory and honor. So we'll sing of your name, live our lives for your greatness, oh God. And your glory and honor, oh Lord, our Lord. Oh, how awesome are your ways. Majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, may we see your kingdom come. Father, may your will be done in all the earth. The earth is full of the glory of God. Come make my of the name above all names creation cries out and every knee bows Jesus we crown you oh Lord our Lord sing it again the earth is full of the glory of God come make much of above all names, creation cries out, and every knee bows, Jesus we crown.
sing this together. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. Come on. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Yeah, He has done great things. And break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken the life. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Yes and amen, you will do great things. Oh God, you do great things. Oh hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. Isn't he good today? Isn't he good? Well, it's good to be back. It's good, it's good to be back leading. Uh, honestly, it's good to uh, be able to talk. <laughs> I couldn't do that for a little while. Maybe that was a gift. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I just want to say a shout out to Fraser. Shout out to Eric for uh, helping out. I love these guys. Uh, can we just give them a round of applause? Again, the theme of our service is, is may the Lord's will be done. And uh, I think to pray, may thy will be done, is, is to pray a, a prayer of surrender. And we're going to go back to one of the, the, the great all-time surrender hymns. Uh, this is a bit of a new arrangement. So one thing I, I do want to draw attention to is in this arrangement, there's some liberties taken where after verse 1, we're not going to sing the chorus. The reason I bring that up is I, I know that when you know a song really well and you're in church, and you, you get ready to sing that part, and then they don't. It's like, uh, and, and you just feel awkward. So I'm trying to spare you the awkwardness. Uh, we'll see. And if it's awkward, it's awkward. Let's sing together. <laughs> All to Jesus. All to Jesus I surrender. 
to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live good job let's sing all to Jesus Surrender humbly at His feet I bow Worldly pleasures all forsaken Take me, Jesus, take me now I surrender all I surrender our prayer all to Jesus So Lord God, we come today and we, we make that our prayer that we surrender all. And yet, we also know that surrender is so hard for us, God. And so in the places in our hearts where we are holding back, I pray that you would speak to us and minister to us, soften our hearts, build safety, surround us with the people that we need to bring safety to our lives so that we will surrender, God. And we just pray, Father, just like David prayed, grant us a willing heart to sustain us in this life. But we do, we come and we say, all glory to Jesus this morning, all glory to Jesus, all glory to him who has saved us, who has redeemed us. So minister, have your way here today, we pray in the name of Jesus. And everybody says, amen, amen. Great to sing with you, everyone. Let's uh, have a seat. Well, good morning, everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm Tom. I'm the children's ministry director here at Central, a.k.a. the big kid, and they gave me a microphone. All right. I have a job to do. Announcements. Let's make this exciting. Announcement number one. Welcome. Especially if you're new and this is your first time, a special welcome to you. And for those who are tuning in online, I can see you. Oh, no, I can't. But welcome, and for everybody who's been here forever, I saved some welcomes for you too. Here you go, here you go, here you go. All right, announcement number two, Lord's Supper. We are, we are remembering the Lord's Supper after the service, so if you're online, uh, just a reminder to prepare the elements at home. That, again, will be at the end of the service. Number three, big announcement, online church directory. That's right, welcome to the future. 
We have an online church directory, but don't be intimidated. It's actually really helpful. We have this fancy little app, Church Center app. Uh, you would have been given an email that gave you instructions how to download this and put this on your phone. If you're not on that email list, you can just email the office a quick kind of, hello, could I be on this email? I want to sign up for this Church Center app and this church directory thing. It's kind of like a church Facebook for all of us. And if you're one of those people that's like, Tom, I can't do that. I, I don't even know how to do email really that well. Well, we have tech support in the foyer after the service for the next two weeks. Um, how to identify that you need help? Uh, maybe if you just lay up and roll around on the floor, kicking your legs in the air and screaming. It works for my five-month-old son. So that will definitely draw the tech people over to assist you with your problems. Um, yeah, maybe don't do that. <laughs> Although that would be entertaining. <laughs> Um, and if you want to use your own photo from 30 years ago, uh, you can, I guess. You know who I'm talking to. Or you can get a new one, right? A modern, up-to-date one so we recognize you. Uh, you can take your own, of course, a selfie. But if you would like somebody to take your photo, Kaylee will be up there on the balcony, just kind of that over there over the stairs. She'll be taking photos today and after. Uh, next week after the service, so you can get an updated photo for us to smile at. And if you don't know how to smile, photographer, just tell them to say, Booyah, Grandma! It works a lot. Trust me, I did school photos for six years. Lots of smiles. <laughs> All right, number four, neighborhood market. Ron is actually looking for some more volunteers Mondays from 1 to 3 p.m. For those who don't know, neighborhood markets is great ministry that we have where we package food for those who need it. And they come to the church and we offer them some groceries uh, to help them through the week. So a really great ministry, a really great chance to represent Jesus in our community. And so Ron's looking for some more volunteers. You can contact the church office saying, I'd love to be a part of that ministry on Mondays. And announcement number five, giving. I just want to thank you, church family, for your generosity. Of course, we're not, you don't have to give, but we know that you give joyfully. And so I just want to thank you, especially on behalf of the Lord. He knows you who are sacrificing or giving generously to his uh, efforts here in Victoria. I just, you know, I don't know about you, but I've been getting a lot of political emails lately. And so why we give is kind of like we're supporting the campaign Jesus for King. So if you think of it that way, that's what we're doing. We're supporting Jesus for King, Jesus for Mayor, Jesus for Prime Minister, World Leader, right? That's what we're doing when we give. We are supporting his campaign. And then number six, I'm going to invite... Someone new for some of you, but she's been around for a while. Caitlin Myers, you'll please come up to the stage. Oh, look, stools. I requested a couple ferns too, but I see they're not here. Mm, too bad. Anyway, this is Caitlin Myers, and Caitlin, uh, you're now the children's ministry intern slash urban adventures director slash Tom's minion. So, I think that's the official title. Yeah. Oh, we know it's Tom's babysitter. We know, we know. Um, so, what brought you to apply for that position? What or who led you to? Yeah, so I've been coming to Central for the past five years. I've been pretty involved within the youth ministry. Um, and this past year, I was trying to decide what to do with my summer in between university semesters. And I typically go to camp, um, but it just wasn't going to look like the same this year. So, I was kind of looking at all my options. Um, and the one thing that was really laid on my heart was not to leave this church. I wanted to be here for my youth girls and be here for the kids ministry. And so this opportunity came up and I got really excited about planning urban adventures this summer. So that's what I, yeah, I applied and it worked out. Awesome. Yes, Caitlin had an amazing resume with all your past ministry, working with Kiwanos and the like. Uh, it was kind of a no brainer on <laughs> the church staff. Like, yes, we'd love to hire you. All right, question number two. What are you most excited about for Urban Adventures this summer? Remember, kids are watching. They want to know, Caitlin, what's the theme? What are we doing? What's exciting? So the theme this year is worshiping God through the arts. It's going to be a whole Spark Studio setup in here, so it's going to look really amazing, I can promise you. And we have some really fun out trips planned for the afternoons. And it might involve a trampoline park, flying squirrel, one of the afternoons, so I'm really excited about that. You hear that, kids? Trampolines! <laughs> All right, question number three. 
How can we pray and support you this summer as we enter into the busy season of planning for urban adventures? Yeah, so this summer we really want to be able to reach kids who don't know the gospel and don't know Jesus. So we just ask that you join us in prayer as we present the gospel to them um, and open up their hearts to Jesus and that the registration will come in for them. Um, and then also volunteers. So we are back to full capacity for urban adventures um, after the pandemic restrictions have lightened up. So we are quite in need for volunteers, for team leaders, for kitchen staff, for anyone in the tech team. So I'm gonna ask if anyone is free from July 18th to 22nd and want to put in a few volunteer hours, they would be greatly appreciated. Um, we have openings in practically every area you can think of. So if you have any talents of any type, <laughs> let me know. Um, we can work something out. So yeah, come find me or talk to me about it. Awesome. And then her email is caitlin at centralbaptistchurch.ca. So if you want to get a hold of her in regards to anything Urban Adventures, again, if you're artsy-fartsy in any way, we would love to have you because, again, we're celebrating God through the arts. So if you've got a talent in painting, construction, anything really, uh, that's what the summer theme's about. So it'll be really cool for the kids to see all the talent that our church family has on display in regards to worshiping and serving the Lord. Awesome. All right, kids, at this moment, we're free to go down into kids' church. Our scripture reading this morning is from Matthew 26, verses 36 to 46. Please turn to Matthew 26 in your Bibles or follow along on your insert or on the words on the screen. And let's stand for the reading of God's word. Matthew 26, 36 to 46. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. I missed you all. <laughs> In case you didn't miss us, Martha and I have been gone for a month and lots has changed in the time we were gone. Look at that. We are very glad to be back. Actually, I'm very glad to be back. Martha is still on the east coast of the US where she's visiting her family and friends. She stayed on one extra week. She will return to me tomorrow, Lord willing, I hope. And uh, we look forward to continuing to serve you here. Thank you for those of you who prayed for our trip. It was amazing. We were able to go all the way back to Kyrgyzstan for 10 days where we lived and served for the seven or eight years prior to coming to Central and visited the international church there. It was a marvelous experience. God gave us safety and health and just a great time reconnecting with friends 
uh, both in Kyrgyzstan and with Martha's family and friends on the east coast of the USA. So thank you for praying. We thoroughly enjoyed our time uh, in both places. Martha is, because she's not in Victoria, is not able to be with us, but I brought her on video for you. Actually, this video was prepared before we left, and what I want to do is invite you to listen very carefully to the message that Martha has on this video. The ideas on this video have emerged over the past few months of conversation between Martha and several other women at the church here, and they represent an area of discussion that we as a leadership believe is very important and significant as we continue to pursue our vision of renewing our community through the gospel, renewing our own lives through the gospel. The beautiful truth of the gospel is that it shines light and brings transformation into every area of our lives. And this area that Martha will raise is something that's not often spoken about, perhaps, but it is an area that desperately needs to be brought into the, the, the loving light and tender love and transformative light of Jesus. This video message is directed specifically to the women of our church community, but men, I do want to assure you that we've been in similar conversations and we'll continue this in the coming months also for men. For, but for now, let's listen to what Martha has to say to us. Good morning. My name is Martha Horton. And I'd like to take a few moments to speak particularly to the women in our church family about our sexual integrity, something we rarely talk about in church. I know that sexual sin often causes women to feel abnormal, ashamed, and alone. Maybe you have struggled with something in your past, or maybe you're struggling now with unwanted thoughts or behavior. Maybe you think if people knew, they wouldn't understand and they would judge you. Or perhaps you sometimes justify unwanted thoughts or behaviors because you feel you're not harming anyone or that scripture doesn't explicitly name them. If any of these that I've mentioned is part of your story, you are not alone. Recently, some women approached me and told me their stories how God had brought their struggle into his light and healing. They told me that sexual sin was an area in their lives that they never felt they could confess. Several months ago, the Holy Spirit was separately but simultaneously convicting these women of their need to confess. Eventually, uh, an opportunity came up where they could share with one another and with a few other Christian women. It was an evening where Christ's body did as scripture teaches, to bear each other's burdens and to point each other back to grace, forgiveness, and healing. The women have formed accountability partnerships that are bringing peace and helping them to gain victory in ways that they hadn't been able to before. After doing some research, we found that there is a lot of biblically sound resources for women in this area. As I was reading and listening to some resources, some things surfaced in my own life that I'd forgotten about, things that I can bring to the light. So why am I giving you this announcement? I'd like you to know that in early June, Central will be starting a confidential support group for women in a private location outside of the church. A place providing a space for sharing, learning, healing, and accountability. In this group, we hope to go through various resources to compile material for a, uh, an official launch for a women's support ministry in sexual integrity in the future. If you'd like more information about this group, send an email to regeneration.central at gmail.com. This group, with all of your correspondence, will be strictly confidential. We also will be sending out a follow-up email with this contact. 
Please pray for us as we develop this ministry and seek to become more like Christ. Thank you. The email was already sent out, so if you look back in your history, you should see it. If you would like it, you can always, Martha's coming back tomorrow, you're free to contact her directly to ask about it. Regeneration.central at gmail.com is the email address. Would you please join me in prayer? As we continue to look in our series on the Lord's Prayer, the phrase we come to is very fitting in response to what we've just heard. Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so, gracious Father, we enter into your very presence with boldness and yet with great humility. We come boldly because we know we do not come on our own merit, but only because of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. But we come with great humility because we know that as we look honestly into our own hearts, we recognize how susceptible we are to the temptations and sins of this world in which we live. And so we come now in prayer. We open our hearts to you and we say, Father, your will be done in every area of our lives as it is in heaven. We join with King David in the prayer that he prayed, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Father, I pray that our church would be a place of much grace and love and forgiveness as we seek to encourage one another to allow the beautiful power of the gospel to transform us more and more into the image of Jesus in every area of our lives. Give us the courage we need to carefully open our lives to each other and step forward in such a way that the light of Jesus will shine brighter and brighter from our community out into the streets of our city. Let us be agents of gospel transformation as we carry the message of hope to a world that so desperately needs it. Today, we continue to intercede on behalf of our broken world, broken in so many places, but especially again in Ukraine. We pray for, for peace. We pray for cessation of violence. We pray for those who hold power in their hands. Lord, would you capture their attention? May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray also again for our nation of Canada. We pray for our political leaders at every level from municipal to provincial to federal. May our leaders stand for righteousness and justice. And here again we ask, Lord, your will be done on earth as in heaven. As we turn our attention back to our church community, I want to praise you and give thanks to you during this season of transition because you have placed good people in this church in positions of leadership. I thank you for each board member. I thank you for the board as a whole. Thank you for the stable and thoughtful leadership they are providing as we move into this season of seeking your will regarding a new lead pastor. I thank you also for the staff team. I thank you for the privilege that I have to work alongside of them. I thank you for each ministry leader, every one of them who is faithfully carrying out the vision for their particular area of ministry. Would you today encourage their hearts, give them strength, give them enthusiasm for the work that is before us. Thank you for reminding us over and over again that you, Jesus, really are the chief, shef chief shepherd of our church. Help us to lean fully into you, finding much joy and purpose as we follow where you will lead us. Father, your will be done in our church as it is in heaven. And now as we pay attention to, our, to your word, I pray that you'll open our ears and our hearts and would you equip Scott as he teaches us today. Let us receive the word from you, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, hello, everybody. 
and uh, let me add my word of welcome to you as well, whether you're here in the, in the building or online. It's uh, great to be with you again today, uh, especially given our, our uh, teaching series. And uh, if you've been around Central for a bit, you know that we are dealing with, in the middle of, and, and, and actually it's been all through the service so far, the Lord's Prayer, or what we're calling the prayer that embraces the world. Because part of the challenge here, or part of the, um, the nature of the prayer itself, is that it's universal, its scope is universal. It isn't just a matter, it isn't just a matter of our individual daily lives, although as we'll see today, hopefully, it includes that, but it, it, it expands beyond that, it extends beyond that. It is, it considers the entire movement of our globe, of our earth, and uh, the intention that God has to bring it together again, to renew it, to redeem it under his sovereign care, the way that it was intended. And so today we are looking at the phrase, again, as it's been repeated here, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Or, if you remember last week, right, it's an imperative. It's in third person, so literally it's saying, God, please, let it be the case that your will is done on earth, in this realm, this realm that has been broken, this realm that has been marred, this realm that you are actively, because of the cross of Christ, his death and resurrection and ascension, his present ministry, is, is uh, be, uh, being brought back, it redeemed, renewed, as it is um, on this, in this realm, as it is in heaven, in that part of your created um, universe that is under complete uh, under your will completely. But it seems to me, but before I kind of, we, we jump into this, I want to do a little bit of, I want to talk a little bit pastorally with you if I could, because it, it occurs to me, uh, well, I'll, I'll put it this way, after a couple decades or a few decades of pastoral ministry, there's few things that I come across, issues in our lives for most believers that cause us the most angst or grief is our prayer life. Uh, I'm sure if uh, I was to go around and ask each one of you or we were to do a survey online, uh, would you like to be a better prayer, if I could put it in those words? Would you like to pray better? I would, I, would, I would bet if I was a betting man, I'm not, but if I was, I would bet it's probably close to 100%. There's, a, there's, a, there's an implicit challenge and desire. We hear about it. We read about it. We know scripture invites us into this by God's grace, into this communication, into this connection that we have with God, this conversation that we can have with God. And yet some of us feel, all of us, I think we do at one time or another, feel something is missing or we at least want to grow. We, we feel like we're not... We're not doing what scripture teaches us and we're not accomplishing, we're not seeing these kinds of things. Um, and, and so I, I want to address that a little bit here. And, and to do this, to illustrate this, I want to tell you a little bit about my family. And yes, I do have a family. <laughs> now I realize that might be hard to, for some of you to believe, some of you might be wondering, but I am married and have a family. Uh, if you're not aware, I should say, uh, when I first started here at Central in, in December, my wife Michelle and I, we decided that we were going to allow our youngest daughter, Olivia, to complete her final year of public education, her grade 12 year, back in Lethbridge where they are presently. But that means that I'm here on my own and have been now for a few months. Uh, but I, I do have a wife, her name is Michelle and she is a real person. Uh, and I feel like I have to say that out loud every once in a while just to remind myself. Uh, but, um, and there are many significant byproducts of our marriage, my marriage to Michelle. Oh, uh, I should say here, here, you can show the first picture. Here's, here's our family. So uh, this is, sorry about the, the quality of this picture. My, my, my family, my kids are going to roll their eyes. I'm not the greatest photographer uh, with my phone. I don't always remember to bring it out. And when I do, the pictures are of kind of that quality. So, But anyway, you can kind of get an idea. That's us on Lake Louise about a year ago. Uh, and, uh, I, and, and so I want to tell you a story about one of my daughters, an interaction that I had with, with her a number of years ago. In fact, this daughter, Cassidy, 
the one that's gonna have the arrow in just a second, there she is, okay? Um, a number of years ago, when Cassidy looked more like this, right, about 10 or 11, she and I had had a, f a fascinating conversation about prayer. I remember exactly where we were. <laughs> I remember her room, and I remember kind of, she was sitting down in, 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 on her bed, and, and I was standing up. We were chatting about, she was having a, a, an issue. She was struggling with something. She was frustrated about something. There was a challenge that she was facing. I don't remember the specific details of this one in particular, but I know she was frustrated. And so I stopped. We were chatting about it for a little bit, and so I stopped for a moment, and I said, well, Cassidy, uh, let's just stop for a bit, and let's pray about it. Let's talk to God about it. I'll never forget how she responded because I think her words, as you'll see in a second, are a reflection of some of the words in the deepest, darkest corners of our hearts are actually echoed in the same way. Maybe not as starkly, but here's what she said. No, I don't want to pray. I've tried that. It doesn't work. I've tried that. It doesn't work. What a great statement. What an honest statement. And as I said, it resonated with me when she said that. Because I, although I haven't put it in those exact words, I felt that. I wonder how many of you have felt that as well. I've tried that. It doesn't work. This is what I mean. This is the underlying issue that we need to address. That, in fact, we need to address this regularly. Because it doesn't matter how deeply we get to know the Lord's Prayer and the details and the terminology and the context and all of that. If underneath all of that is a mistrust or a doubt or a concern that this activity is actually beneficial or meaningful or purposeful, then we are lost before we begin. Now in that moment with Cassidy, I was at a bit of a loss, I have to admit. I didn't have an answer just like that for her. So I just took a moment in, in my heart and just prayed and asked God just to show me something in her life that I could use to try to help her make sense of this thing that we, we, we all challenge, we, we all wrestle with. And and uh, this, is, this, is, this is, again, I hadn't thought about this before, this was an inspiration in the moment and this is, God's work, I think, coming through, and so I could communicate this. And so, at the time, Cassidy loved art and loved to draw and to color and all of that. And so I said, Cassidy, let me put it to you this way. Let's, what if you had sat down, you were all excited about drawing something, and you had uh, you got the nice clean white piece of paper in front of you, and you were to take a, a pen or a felt or something, and you were to start drawing your picture. And right at that moment, just as you started, that one little line, that first little line, I, I walked by. And I said, oh, Cassidy, that, that's a terrible picture. Oh, and you call yourself an artist? You can't draw at all. How would, you, how would that make you feel? Well, obviously, she said, that would hurt me. That would bother me. And I said, why would that bother you? Because, Daddy, you don't know what I'm drawing. And I said, that's it. That's the point of prayer. And so let me encourage you in your prayer life. And I'm certain that, that um, many of you in this room and at home are struggling with this. Because if you've tried it all, if you've tried to engage this with all, uh, at, at all over the course of, of any amount of time, you've wondered. And so let me encourage you to say that there are some times in our lives when we go through these challenges, when we're drawn to pray, when our inclination, when the spirit at work in us draws us to pray, that we need to pray even though we don't see the great picture that God is drawing at the moment. We just see that line that doesn't make sense to us, that, doesn't, that isn't clear to us, and yet we still need to pray. So I want to encourage you with that as we, as we continue and finish off this series, that in spite of all of this, deal with both. Deal with the details of the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that embraces the entire world, but also, don't 
also nurture and care about your heart with each other. Discuss this with other uh, people. Take opportunities to encourage each other as you pray that God is at work. He's invited us into his work. We don't always see what he's doing, but God is at work. Now let's consider what it means to pray. Let your will be done. I want to do a few things this morning, just briefly here in in our time. I want to talk about, I want to uh, introduce or give some um, insight into the nature of God's will so we can try to come to terms with this aspect. And then I want to talk about the, those, the implications of praying your will or let it be the case that your will uh, is done, Father, as it relates to our conduct and as it relates to the control that we desire for our lives. So first let's talk about the, the term or the nature of God's will. And here I want to turn to Romans chapter 12, or at least draw this to your attention anyways, because it provides, especially in verse 2, it provides a great summary of the nature of God's will. Uh, the, the nature here in verse 2 is this, three words, it's good, it's acceptable, and it's perfect. Let me give you the, the full context of these two verses. Paul writes at the beginning of of, uh, Romans 12, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God, what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. There you go. Each of these terms, I think, provides unique insight into the nature of God's will. First, we see that God's will is good. And right off the bat, we're sort of hit with a bit of a confusing thing sometimes, right? Because if we're walking with God, if we are in relationship with God, there are times in our lives, all of us know this, where it doesn't feel good to follow Jesus. We're challenged in some way. It could be with our health, it could be with our financial circumstances, it could be with our own uh, level of faith, our own trust, our own growth. And yet here we are at the very beginning to say the first word Paul uses is God's will, that which is good. So what is he saying here? What does he mean by this, this word good? It's, it's not something in addition to God. It is who God is. Therefore, if God's, we are in relationship with God, that means by nature that his goodness, he will impart his goodness to us. And, and, and what is good for us is equivalent to what we were made for. And see, it makes sense, though, when, when you kind of step back a little bit and think about it, right? Our creator, the one who, who originated all of this, who got this all started, who knows you and me, who brought us into being, it makes sense that he's going to know what's best for us. And not just what's best for us, as we'll see, but what's good, what we were made for. Not just in general, not just humans, but as individuals. This is the beauty and the power and the wonder of God's gospel to us. Is that God, he's invited us as individuals, as much as he has as a group. Individuals for us to walk individually with him. And in that, he knows what uh, his will for us is good. But God's will is also acceptable or literally means well-pleasing. In the end, so again, when we, when we think through the logic of this a little bit, it makes sense. In the end, if God knows what's best for us, what is good for us, and by virtue of this relationship that we have, because he is good, that his goodness is going to be imparted as a result of this relationship, that we are gonna experience this, and if this is what we were made for, then we're gonna gonna benefit. We're gonna experience the pleasure that comes from stepping in line with what is good for us. Now, as I said, don't get me wrong, I'm not here presenting that everything, as soon as you follow Christ or or start to follow Christ, that everything's gonna go nice and easy. 
That's not what I'm saying at all. That by the end, each step of the way, remember that little line, we've only seen part of it. Sometimes we don't see it all, but in the end, as we walk and as we take these steps, we, we receive his goodness. And as we receive his goodness, we sense his pleasure and we experience joy in the midst of this. This is another characteristic, another part, another part of the nature of God's will. Paul also describes the will of God as something perfect. Again, makes sense when you, when you, when you think about these three things in relationship to each other, right? If God knows what, who we are, if God knows us as individuals, if God has, and he knows that because he's the one who made us, who brought us into being, and, he's in, uh, and, he's, and he cares about how we live our life. That's another piece I, I missed earlier. That, that's important as well, right? So it's not that God's just designed and got this started and then backed up and said, I don't care about this, I'm gonna go on to something else. But God's invested into, in this world, vested in our lives, invested in our relationship with him. And so he imparts that goodness by his very nature. As a result of that goodness, we, we, we sense his pleasure. We are pleased with it, is well-pleasing. And then as we do that step by step, through the challenges, through the struggles, then we are led to this idea of perfection. Or another way this word gets translated in the New Testament is, is mature or complete. Right? You see this step by step. God's goodness imparted to us. We, we sense his pleasure. As we do that, we continue to step one at a time through all of this. That leads us to this idea of perfection is perfect for us, is exactly what we need. Modern terminology uses the word flourishing, and I'm happy to use that here. This is what's gonna result in our flourishing, is when we walk in step with God's will, when we submit in step by step with God's will, that's when we flourish, as humanity and as individuals. That's the nature. This is the characteristic of God's will that we, we, are, um, we mean when we start to pray, Father, let your will be done, right? Doesn't that make sense? We want God's goodness. We want to experience it in our lives, but we also want it to extend to the world, right? We want to, we want to know the, the, the pleasing nature of what is good for us, and we, not just us, but others. And we, and we want to finish this so that God shapes us and molds us and God uses us, and God perfects us. And so we then become mature, complete, lacking in nothing. That's the end, that's the goal, that's the perfection. This is the nature of God. This is the nature of God's will for which we pray. But there is more for us to consider this morning. The nature of God's will and the desire expressed in Jesus' teaching prayer raise two issues that challenge some of what feels like uh, part of the very core of who we are. Our conduct, how we choose to live our life, and the control of our life. Who makes the decisions? Who allows to happen or, or for the experiences to happen that, that actually happen? Is it me? Or is it God? The prayer, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, applies to both God's righteous demands. So yeah, let's deal with conduct first. Sorry, I should have clarified that. Let's deal with conduct first. The prayer, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, applies to both God's righteous demands, right? Again, part of his character, part of what it means to uh, ask for God's will to be done and his de determination to bring about certain events in salvation history. In Matthew uh, chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus explains this. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who, here, catch this, who does the will of my Father in heaven. So there's an expression there's a response to God's will. And, and Phil prayed about that, right? Right at the beginning of his pastoral prayer, he's, he's addressed this to say, out of our desire to respond to this with our own lives, part of this prayer, when we express, Lord, your will be done, let it be the case, 
is a desire, is implicit in this, is a desire to say, give me the strength to respond to your will in obedience. So in this case, as we see in Matthew chapter seven, the emphasis is on our active obedience to his commands. So let me be clear right at this moment here. The gospel, the work of Christ, is the cause for our ability even to think about doing this. It's because of his work that is summarized in the term that we use quite regularly, the gospel, it's because of this that we can then say to each other, let's obey God. This is not something that we do on our own. This is not uh, uh, um, something that has to happen first in order for us to be in God's will. This is a response to what God has already done through Christ. This is a response to what God has already offered to us through the indwelling spirit that each of us who follows Christ has in our lives. And so then we can say, with that as the background, then we can say, let us respond in obedience to his expressed will, to his commands. Uh, the gospel writers, the, the, the uh, New Testament writers, actually Paul for sure makes this really clear. In fact, it, we just have to go to the, the book we were looking at earlier, Romans, right? The first 11 chapters of the letter of, of the Romans to the Romans sets the groundwork, explains the gospel, what God has done on our behalf in order for, make it, for it to be, to be made possible for us to respond. But then he moves on to our response, right? Chapter 12, we just read the first two verses of chapter 12, begins with the word, therefore. As a result of Christ, all that Christ has done, all that God has promised and planned and brought to, to fruition through his planning, through the faithfulness of Christ, then we can say, therefore, because of all of that, now we can offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. We can respond in obedience to his expressed commands, his expressed will. But in addition to our obedience, Scripture describes God as working towards particular ends, as willing certain things related to the establishing of God's kingdom. So in many ways, this last line of this first section of the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that embraces the world, is kind of a summary of all of that. What happens when God's name is glorified? What happens when God's kingdom comes is that the result is his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. These two realms are brought together. These two arenas of God's activity are brought together and we see that in Revelation chapter 21. It's brought together and so then his will is done. So God acts, this is part of his will. And this is where the text that Lindsay read for us earlier is helpful. Right, this amazingly dramatic verse, passage of scripture that Matthew records for us and explains Jesus' interaction with his father just before he's about to be arrested because he knew he was heading towards his execution and yet he wrestled with it, right? And as Matthew said, three times he came and said, God, you know how this is, Father, you know how this is troubling me. I don't, let this cup pass from me. But I also know this. I also know what you intend. And though it's not explicit in the passage, it also needs to be understood. This is what I signed up for, to put it crassly, Jesus saying. This is what I voluntarily have, have come to do. I know this. So in the end, I just want to acknowledge not my will, not these feelings of, of, um, of troubling, uh, not those, not that will, but your will be done. And he does it three times. Because Jesus understood that there's just something about the way God works, that he will bring his salvation, he will bring his kingdom, at some day the kingdom will come, at some day Jesus will return. It's inevitable. And Jesus said that's part of God's will. He acknowledges that, not my will, but yours be done, no matter what it means no matter what I have to do, no matter how I suffer. Agreement is at the heart of God's will, even for Jesus. To pray this prayer then means that we are putting our conduct 
on the line. How I think I should live myself against God's will. And again, Jesus' example looms large for us. Three passages I just want to quickly highlight for you where Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. This is a commitment. We need to reflect this in our lives. Jesus said elsewhere, I seek not my own will in John chapter five, but the will of him who sent me. This should be echoed in our prayers. It should be, we should uh, recognize this implicitly when we're praying, Lord, let your will be done. I don't seek my own will, but, but your will. And then finally in John chapter six, I have come down from heaven, Jesus said, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And in some ways, we can pray something, pray something similar, right? I exist, I'm alive, not for my own will, but God, for your will. That's a challenge though, right? That's a struggle we have with uh, it, right? It's not easy. It doesn't always make sense. It's not always a, 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 an obvious step. But this is all part of the prayer. Let your will be done. Right? It isn't who, just who Jesus is that is important to us. It isn't just that Jesus is God and he's divine and his sacrifice is perfect and complete and nothing else needs to be done. That he has accomplished it all. It's not just who he is, but how he lived also that is important. His righteousness makes it possible for us to be righteous before God and then pray that our lives display God's will through our conduct, just like Jesus did. Don Carson summarizes these ideas for us nicely in his commentary on Matthew when he writes this. So, for that will to be done includes both moral obedience and the bringing to pass of certain events, such as the cross. It is therefore, hear this, impossible to pray this prayer, Lord, let your will be done, uh, impossible to pray this prayer in sincerity without humbly committing oneself to such a course. This is the profound nature of this line, let your will be done. It includes, by necessity, a, uh, a, um, this aspect of humbly committing oneself to that course. But it's not just about our conduct. In addition to our conduct, the will of God impinges also on the control we demand for our life. And that's number two, the second part, our control. Here we look to James's letter for insight. In chapter four, at verse 13, we read these words. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, James suggests, you ought to say, if the Lord wills we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Some pretty harsh sounding words from Brother James. That's his style though. If you know his letter. To me, reading James is like someone grabbing you by the collar and kind of shaking you and saying, you gotta get things together. So, so what, what James said here, all oh, boasting is evil. You boast in your arrogance. That's, that's James grabbing us by the collar saying, listen up. Don't get distracted. Get things straight. We do these things by God's will. Last week I explained, so here, just another tidbit for uh, understanding James a little bit. Last week I talked about the imperative mood. And um, in my opinion, James is the king of the imperative. He averages an imperative. Remember the imperative, the exclamation mark, right? The passionate expression, the command. He averages one imperative every two verses. So if, if James, so if I can put it another way, if James were, can, were texting you, if he was alive now and he was texting you, it would all be in caps lock. <laughs> I'm certain of it. So, but James's point is that the activities of our lives themselves also fall under the sovereignty of God. God is just as interested in where we are going as how we are getting there. He is orchestrating not only the details of who we are, crafting us into a vessel that is useful for his purposes, but he's also orchestrating a wonderful symphony with all our lives. 
One note that is played through the event of my life corresponding to but on a different line is another note of your life and so on. Different notes played together that result in divine harmony. And as with a good piece of music, sometimes the melodies change, sometimes the keys change, sometimes it's a major, it's a minor, sometimes the piece intentionally contains discord in order to then demonstrate the relief that comes from a resolution. But this is God at work. This is God's interest in our lives. This is God's intention of not just looking at our conduct, not just inspiring our conduct as individuals, but in orchestrating that. So this aspect of God's will relates to the question, well, how do I know God's will for my life? The answer comes from both segments of the will of God. First, he has communicated his will in terms of our conduct, the how part of our life. Part of knowing God's will comes from digging into scripture on our own and with others. Reading and seeking to understand that part of God's will is relatively straightforward. Obedience. That's our response. How do we know God's will? Obey. Step one is to decide to trust God enough with your conduct. The second piece can be a bit more mysterious, but that's where James comes in. Following James, we acknowledge that God's will is good for us, that it is pleasing to us, and that it means that it is the means by which we flourish as human individuals, but that some of the details are not immediately known at the moment. So we make our plans, this is James' advice, and then we commit them to God, such that we find peace in God's will and not ours. The line, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, provides a way to conclude this first section of Jesus' teaching prayer. Ultimately, God's name will be glorified and God's kingdom will come. This is the promise that we read in verses 10 and 11 of Philippians 2. You know this passage where Paul writes to the Philippians so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth, those realms, everybody. And under the earth, and every tongue confess, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's his promise. That's his claim. In his commentary on Matthew, our source for the Lord's Prayer again, John Nolan summarizes this for us. He writes this. The third petition the one let your will be done, encompasses the scope of the first two, unifying their respective present and future orientations by focusing on the common central thread that in a comprehensive way, people should come to act in conformity to the will of God. So, how can we respond? I'm going to go over three things, and and as I do that, I'm going to invite the music team to come uh, back on stage to get ready for our, our next song. How do we respond? Let me suggest three things. First is this, pray this prayer with awareness, especially this, these first sec- this first section that we've gone through already. Pray this prayer with a- awareness. And I meant to mention this last week, but if you haven't memorized it yet, memorize it. Start there. Again, don't, don't see it. Remember, this is Jesus' teaching prayer. This isn't the only prayer, but this is a way to help put our, the rest of our prayers in context, so memorize it. But, but then as you do, remember, this is meant to be prayed with passion, to engage this prayer. God, Let it be the case. Let it be the case. Number two, to grow in your trust of God's will for your life by developing your understanding of who God is. This is where we just need to be in scripture. This is where we need to be in community. This is where we need to have conversations. We need to grow in our understanding so that our trust can grow as we get to know who God is. Right, the the, the purpose is that we can take another step forward in our trust and our expression of that. And then finally, foot number three, encourage others to trust God's will as well. Enter into the challenges with people, right? Don't feel like you have to have all the answers, right? I didn't, when I, when I chatted with Cassidy and, and gave her that illustration, when God did and, and he inspired me to do that, it wasn't the detail, it wasn't the answer, it was the perspective that God brought, right? Did you catch that? So sometimes we need to enter in with people and say, look, I don't know the specifics. 
I, I, I really don't know what you should do at this particular moment, but I do know this. God is trustworthy. Let's pray together and let's see what God does. Encourage each other. You and I are invited to not only pray that God's will is done as if it's something only out there. That is part of it. We are also invited to join in with God's will and submit to his will with our lives and in so doing, declare that he is good, he is pleasing, and he is perfect. In just a moment, we are going to actually worship in that vein, in a special way. In addition to the song we're going to sing, we're going to also take part in the Lord's Supper in communion together. That ultimate expression of declaring, God, I th- your will be done. Your kingdom come. And we thank you for all that you've done to make this possible. Let me pray. Father, before you, we do wish to be able to pray with a greater and greater intensity. Your will be done. Your will be done. Your will be done. Your will be done. God, you know we struggle with this. All of us do. It's hard because sometimes, because we don't see everything. And we feel like we've got things under control at some point. And the world tells us that we can take control. So God, help us. Help us remember that at the heart of this is obedience. At the heart of this is the fact that our conduct matters as a response to what you've done. And also the control that we don't actually have. So, so I guess, Father, this prayer is a request that for each person here, for each pers- person, person watching, Father, help us to trust you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall see us safely home.
as your church will lift a voice and pray father not my will but yours be done father not my will but yours be done father not my will but yours be done What a great piece. Thanks, Yanina. That was beautiful. So just before the events that Lindsay read for us in Matthew 26, Jesus gathered his disciples. And he wanted to teach them. He wanted to explain to them what was going to happen and why this mattered. So he didn't sit with them and lecture them. He didn't give them handouts and with, you know, ask them to fill in the blanks. He, he said... We're going to eat together. If you, as you came in, didn't get a chance to pick up one of our uh, handy-dandy little uh, uh, kits with the juice and the the wafer, if you can call it a wafer, then um, we've got people that are ready to give. Just put your hand up, please. Just quick instructions again. If, if you're new here, first time, there's two things to uh, pull back. There's the cellophane on top. Pull that back first. That reveals the, the, um, the wafer. And then the other uh, tinfoil piece is the juice. Anyway, now on to the important things. Jesus took the bread. Bread that had represented for generations, actually, at that time, affliction. Sometimes in air in scripture, the New Old Testament is referred to as the bread of affliction. And it was unleavened bread. And so Jesus said, here's this bread. This bread represents who I am. In fact, it represents my body. I want you to remember this because my body is going to be broken for you. And so then Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he passed it around and he said this is my body do this in remembrance of me so let's take a moment and thank God for this symbol of the body of Christ father we take this moment and we express our our gratitude and father uh, to your ears sometimes it must seem well God, you, you're a God of grace and loving kindness, and so you recognize this. But Father, boy, there's some times when I don't feel like I really get the, the whole profund, profundity of this, that this, that Jesus took what was due me, and he paid for me. It's all done. And he did that for every single person in this room, and then he invites us into this relationship with him. And so, Father, we thank you for this bread as a representative, as a reminder, as a symbol, as nourishment for our soul to say Jesus broke his body for us. Thank you. In his name we pray, amen. The body of Jesus in remembrance of him. And Jesus took the cup. And he said, this is the, this blood is my blood. It's this color. Let it remind you that real blood is going to be shed. Let it remind us that Jesus really shed his blood for us. And and so what Jesus said is the blood that's going to be shed, that's represented here, it's an agreement. It's a new agreement with us and God. A new covenant that's everlasting. And so when we drink of it, we remember Christ's blood and the new covenant, this new relationship that we have. So let's take a moment and thank God for the, for the cup. Father, again, we just turn to you and say, what can we say but thank you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. The blood of Jesus in remembrance of him. (laughs) 
After this, of course, Jesus sends out his disciples. And, and they don't realize what this sending out ultimately means, but we do now. And so we go here with the realization that our sins are paid for. We can walk in grace. We can trust God that his will be done. We've just celebrated a wonderful meal together as a family. And there's one other thing that I want to do as a, we can get to do this morning as a family. And that is welcoming new members. Three, three new members I want to welcome and have you join me in welcoming. First is our brother Nima. And then the other two are the Dubois, Lana and Samuel. And so would you join me in welcoming them to Central? Next week, we're going to have a special guest. And in fact, this is going to sort of um, begin, inaugurate a season where you're going to be having, you're going to be hearing from different, a number of us throughout the summer. Uh, next week, we are privileged to have uh, Mike Mahorder, who is uh, at one of the um, people who works at our, um, uh, at the Fellowship of Evangelical Baptists office. And so he's going to come and encourage us as we start to address some of the, the, uh, the needs and as we start to seek God's will for our next lead pastor. So I hope you will come back and join us and to hear from Mike. And uh, we'll say a little bit more about what's planned for the summer in terms of speaking, but um, we'll start with that this morning. So would you please just stand with me and, uh, and uh, hear this as you're dismissed. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. Go in peace, but don't hoard it. Share it. Thank you for being here. You're dismissed. <laughs>